welcome you to the sixth Labor Day International Public Lecture coming to you live here from the Ohini Kunedu Auditorium of the University for Professional Studies in Accra. Lecture organized by the Institute of Work, Employment and Society as part of the Build Up to Us World Labor Day. Thank you for tuning in to CTTV. Thank you for joining us here for this lecture, which is on the theme, Harnessing Good Work Ethics for Higher Productivity. My name is Bernard Avle, and I'm happy to be your moderator and MC for today. We want to welcome our special invited guest, in particular, our guest speaker, Her Ladyship Justice Gertrude Tokonu, JSC. Please put your hands together. Thank you, madam. We are also privileged to have our Pro VC, Professor John Kweku Mensa Mauto, here with us. It is also an honor to have the director of the Institute of Work, Employment, and Society in the person of Dr. Mrs. Mary Esio here with us. We will be taking solidarity messages from very important stakeholder groups, including the Trade Union Congress, who are represented here by their director of Labor Research and Policy Institute, Dr. Kobna Nyakun Otu. The media will not be left out of such an important occasion, and we are happy to have Executive Secretary, National Media Commission, Mr. George Sapon, also here with us. And because UPSA are such good neighbors, we've invited our cousins from the University of Ghana. We're privileged to have the Director of Human Resources at the University of Ghana, Dr. Yvonne Ayekain Lamte, also here with us. The Reverend Kennel David Adote Asari, here with us. Thank you so much, sir. To now give us more insights into the program, we will take a welcome address, and we want to respectfully invite our Pro VC, Professor John Kweku Mensa Mauto, to bring those remarks. Thank you, Bernard. Her Ladyship, Justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana, members of the University Council, members of Convocation, and then members of the UPSC community, invited guests, indeed friends from the media, our students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. This morning I'm privileged to welcome you to our public lecture on harnessing good work ethics for higher productivity at UPSA. On behalf of my Vice Chancellor, Professor Abednego Okufehi Amate, who is a reverend, I wish to express our sincere gratitude to our honored guest speaker, Her Leadership, Justice Gertrude Tokonu, eminent Justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana. Indeed, Her Leadership, we are privileged to be the first university to host you, highly privileged. Indeed, we are blessed. Once again, we are privileged and so grateful to you for accepting our invitation to speak at this year's lecture and share your insight on this very, very important subject. Your leadership, we also wish to congratulate you heartfully on your nomination by the President of the Republic of Ghana as the incoming Chief Justice. And let me share with you and admit that flipping through various discourse in these few days, your acceptance level is so high, it means the public have so much confidence in you, and we'll be expecting more from you. Today's lecture is a testament to the university's commitment to academic excellence and intellectual discourse. 
a test of paramount importance as it addresses a theme that is of great significance to all of us. As we commemorate the May Day, a day that celebrates the hard work and dedication of workers around the world. As we reflect on the importance of work ethics and productivity, we are reminded of the essential role that workers play in the success of every organization and society. We are extremely privileged to have our leadership joining us to share her vast knowledge and experience in, on this all important subject. Her leadership is well known for her passion for justice and her devotion to the rule of law. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the effort of all the workers, especially workers of UPSA, both inside, within the Medina community, and the country as a whole, who have dedicated their skills and expertise to the service, advancement, and development of this country. We owe a debt of gratitude to all workers and hope that this lecture will inspire them to continue to pursue excellence in their respective fields. Now, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for taking time to be with us today. And I hope that this lecture will be productive and an enlightening experience for you and that we will all live with renewed sense of purpose and commitment to harnessing good works for higher productivity. Once again, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, I welcome you to the campus of UPSA. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, Prophecy, Professor Mauto. Please put your hands together one more time for him. And we want to quickly move to the statement of purpose. And um, the Institute of Work, Employment, and Society have been putting together these lectures for a while now. This is the sixth in the series. And they obviously slept at a good place and prayed well because everything seems to have fallen in place, the right partnerships, the right timing, and the right speaker. So we want to find out from the person who runs that institution how all of this managed to happen within such a short time. So please help me welcome Dr. Mrs. Mary Esiao, Director of IWES, as she comes to bring us the statement of purpose. Oh, please put your hands together one more time. Justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana, members of the University Council, members of Convocation, members of UPS community, invited guests, friends from the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. International Workers' Day or May Day is celebrated annually on May 1st in several countries, even though others observe it on different dates. The day often observed as a public holiday is used to celebrate the hard work of workers worldwide and their contributions to nation's development. The day is also used by labor movement to articulate their concerns to government and ask for better conditions of service, while government in turn use the platform to assure the working class of their commitment to their welfare. Ghanaian workers joined the world to celebrate this day for the first time in 1960. And Ghana's first president, Osajufo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, was declared the number one worker. 
and decorated with a May Day Award by the Trade Union Congress. So this year will mark the 62nd version of May Day celebration, taking the out 1966 when it was suspended following the military coup which toppled Dr. Nkrumah's government in February of that year. Amidst the joyous celebrations, leaders of labor unions in Ghana have come out with thought provoking themes, which often reflect actual feelings and situations at the labor front. For instance, the theme for last year, 2022, was protecting jobs and incomes in the era of COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And this year, the theme is protecting incomes and pensions in the era of economic crisis, our responsibility. It is from this general theme that the Institute of Work, Employment and Society of the University of Professional Studies Accra, lacking on the words, our responsibility, in quotes, would like workers everywhere especially in Ghana, to pause and reflect on the ethical aspects of our responsibility. We need to protect incomes and pensions. I believe most of us, in our quiet moment, can still hear the sounds and voices of some of our senior citizens emphasizing that their pensions are for medications, food, and very basic necessities of life and must be protected. The same applies to incomes of those in active service. During the few months that I have had the opportunity to serve as the director of human resource for this great university, one of my greatest fears has been that the government might not have enough funds to pay its employees. I believe that it is the same for all employers, whether public or private. It is in this vein that I West approach our eminent speaker, her ladyship, Justice Gertrude Tokonu, the next Chief Justice of our dear nation, Ghana. <laughs> to speak to us on the topic, harnessing good work ethics for higher productivity. The reason being that to protect incomes and pensions, we have to be productive. And without good work ethics, all our efforts as workers geared at productivity will come to naught. And you will all agree with me that we couldn't have chosen a better speaker than her. Madam Chief Justice in waiting, thank you for doing us the honest of being our guest speaker for today. We are very grateful. God richly bless you for your devotion to your nation's development amidst all the challenges. So as I was, we congratulate all our hardworking workers everywhere, the whole world. We say Ayuko to all of you. And I hope this lecture will imbue in all of us high ethical values that will be the guiding principles for every worker to be really productive in order that incomes and pensions will actually be protected. Thank you very much. Please, you can do better for our visionary director, visionary and prophetic 
director. Wonderful. I like that. I almost said amen, and I realized I wasn't in church, you know. But we are, we are happy that we are all here today. So what we're going to do is to take very important solidarity messages. And as she said, it's World Labor Day. The workers are the center of this. So we want to now invite the director of Labor Research and Policy Institute, TUC, an economist, Dr. Kwabna Nyakotu, to bring us a short message, a short <laughs> A short message of solidarity. Please put your hands together for Doc. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Um, I don't know how short the short should be. Her ladyship, um, I'm grateful that on the occasion when you are almost the Chief Justice, I've also gotten the opportunity to address uh, this gathering in which you are also the main speaker. Um, a lot has already been said by the previous speaker. So we are celebrating May Day on the team of protecting incomes and pensions. And we are also aware of our responsibility. We are aware of the economic crisis we face. Um, but we live in a country today where you have a minimum wage of 400 per month. And you also have a basic pay on the single spine salary structure, which is actually less than the minimum wage of the 400. It's an illegality of some sort. Because the minimum wage is supposed to be mandatory, and nobody should pay below it. But somehow, we managed to pay below it. So we recognize that we need to be productive. And as we have always been saying, it's the chicken and egg. However, we live in a situation today where the chicken is actually so underfed, so malnourished, that it cannot actually lay the eggs. So that is the reason why we should put the incomes first. Once we have managed to feed the chicken well, then we can talk about the productivity question. But let me also take the opportunity to thank UPSA for your interest in labor issues. This is uh, academic issues, and these are also practical issues. We need the theories, we need all the knowledge from the universities to be able to solve some of these perennial problems. TUC and organized labor, we defend workers. We protect their incomes and pension. And there's always the temptation to be politically correct when you are talking about workers as somebody from labor. But we do recognize the attitude problems we have in this country. We do. So we have written on productivity. We have written on work ethics before. The challenge is that we don't think government and employers take these matters serious. So they only talk about it when we are doing negotiations. And they use it to justify why we should not have a higher percentage. So we want our employers, we want government to take it the issues serious. The attitudes when you go to hospitals. There are attitudes when you go to the universities. And in fact, some of the attitudes, negative attitudes, they emanate from the universities or from our educational system. People are passing without learning. People have masters and they have not mastered anything. They take, yeah, yeah. They take those attitudes to the world of work. So we cultivate it from the education system. And it's important that the education system helps to eradicate these kinds of um, things. You are right. Sometimes you wonder if you look at government books, whether they can find money to pay. If the attitude is right in this country, we can triple our revenues. So the attitude is not just worker attitude. It's a managerial attitude. It's political attitudes. And if the attitude gets right, we can triple revenues, and government will be able to find the money to pay, um, to pay workers and probably pay them more. So there are political managerial attitudes that are also unhelpful, and we need to address them. You should not just only concentrate on ordinary workers and their attitudes. So on this note, let me also recognize that there are organized labor leaders here from NAT, from the Agricultural Workers Union of the TUC, and we are happy to be part of this program. We will actually take the insight from here and be able to galvanize our own base to do the work that we have to be doing. 
we have always said that there's an attitude, ethical, productivity problems in this country. We have written about it, we have pushed for it. Governments and employers only talk about it when we are negotiating. And I think that these attitudes must change. So the attitude of only talking about productivity when we are negotiating, that attitude also must change. That is the only way we can address the attitudinal challenges we have in this country. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kobunau. O2, this is still the Sith International Labor Day public lecture. And the headlines are a bit confusing because this is not the Sith International Labor Day. We've had many Labor Days, but this is the Sith lecture organized by the IWES. So this is just a note to the media people. This is not the Sith. We've been doing Labor Day since before some of us were born. But it's happening live at the UPSA, and we thank all our viewers for joining us on CTTV. We also want to acknowledge Anglo Gold Ashanti, who are partnering us, supporting to make this program happen. We want to now take another message, this time from the National Media Commission. Executive Secretary, Mr. George Sapong, is here, and he's going to speak to us. Please put your hands together for George. As we have learned from our Nigerian brothers and sisters, I stand on existing protocol. As I see the IPS, now UPSA, that was just a small one building structure tagged somewhere on the compound, now grow into such a respected global university with a reputation all over. I'm looking at the quality of the management the quality of the faculty, the ambition of students, and I think that I can only uh, celebrate what I'm seeing. And I th I'll be quick, but permit me to share with you that two people in the room shared those worst feelings with me. Anabo Kashiga was a key member of the student leadership at the time that mounted the protest. He's grown into, I have said publicly that Anabo Kashiga and Hamid Mustafa and a couple of them are some of the most honest politicians I have seen in my life. And I'm happy that he's also connected in one way to this university. And it adds to my excitement. The other one is Fred Do, who was like my spiritual guide, Freddie, thank you. And Freddie is also a member of the faculty of this school. So you can understand my feelings as you involve me in this. But above all, I feel great that I can also have the bragging right as a lawyer that uh, her ladyship's first public appearance, post-nomination, I was part of it. <laughs> but there is something UPSA must also take note. You invited her leadership in one form. She appeared here in another form. Yes. That is great. I see that as the metaphor of the promise you make your students, that you bring them here in one form, and they would live in a bigger form. So I'm really happy to be here with you. And uh, I want to assure you of our support in any form possible. And I think that my brother Bernard's presence here is indicative of the respect the media has for this institution and what all of us are ready to support you to achieve. Thank you very much. Wonderful. It's, it's almost as if you, are, you people are trying to write her speech for her because Everybody's giving some angles to the speech, so I don't know how you're going to, <laughs> whether you edit some out or add some, but this is, and, and when you started on this entering one form, you know, I thought you were going to develop it, I, I like the idea. You, you come in one form. When I was young, my mother used to pray and says, the devil will come at you in one form, but he will run away in seven forms. So that's how I see it. So thank you, George, for always being so uh, graceful and eloquent. We have two more messages before we introduce her ladyship. And this one is from the Global Ethics Network, globalethics.net. And to deliver that for us, indeed, Reverend Emmanuel Ansa was to deliver this 
but we understand as a representative to deliver it. So please come forward and introduce her. Forgive me, I didn't have all the, the details, but put your hands together for her. I think the name is Susan. Susan, forgive me, Susan. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Her Ladyship, Justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana, the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Professional Studies, Accra, the Director and Management Team of the Institute of Work, Employment, and Society, UPSA, distinguished guests, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. It is with honor that I stand here on behalf of the Global Ethics National Director, Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Ansan, who apologetically couldn't be here with us today, to bring you greetings from Globe Ethics. I also wish to acknowledge the support of the management of the University of Professional Studies Accra and our gratitude for the opportunity to be part of today's lectures. By way of introduction, Globe Ethics is an international non-governmental foundation working to equip individuals and institutions for ethical thinking, decision making and action through higher education and policy engagement from cross-cultural and global perspectives. We are domiciled in Geneva, Switzerland with an international board and affiliated centers across the world, including Ghana in West Anglophone Africa. Over the past 19 years, we have developed as a global network of individuals and experts collaborating institutions, educators, and students with an online platform for exchange and access to knowledge resources on ethics. In Ghana, Globe Ethics has been in operation since 2018 and has over the years worked with its local partners, Kingdom Equip Network and the Ghana Integrity Initiative and other collaborating partners and higher education institutions to organize joint ethics events and initiatives. This includes the recent pilot of an institutional self-assessment ethical tool for higher education institutions, which was first hosted by this prestigious university, the University of Professional Studies Accra in 2021. Today's lecture on harnessing good work ethics for higher productivity is a timely reminder of the importance of upholding ethical standards in our workplace as the annual Workers' Day celebration is marked across the world in a few days. This celebration is a strong indication of the importance and contribution of workers to the economic growth, development, and prosperity of nations. It is in light of this that it also becomes evident that there are far-reaching consequences to negative attitudes and actions in the work environment, just like the previous speaker said. Good work ethics that borders on integrity, responsibility, accountability, and transparency are key to continuous improvement and transformation in the individual, organizational, community, and national space. Global Ethics is pleased to be associated with today's lecture, and we continue to offer access to a large number of resources on ethics through our leading global ethics digital library, research facilitation and publishing, online training courses, and global network for information sharing and collaboration. All these can be freely accessed via our website, www.globeethics.net. We look forward to today's presentation by the speaker, Her Ladyship Justice Gertrude Tokono believing that the engagement here would stir up positive action that augurs for general societal good, especially as we celebrate workers and our contribution to national development in a few days. Let us work together to build a culture of ethical behavior and support each other in upholding standards that by so doing overturns the negative narrative and goes on to build trust and respect for societal development and sustainability. Are you equal to all workers? I wish us all a successful lecture today. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Susan Aka from globalethics.net. Our final message of solidarity will come from the University of Ghana, the Director of Human Resources, Dr. Yvonne Ayekai Lamte, will bring that to us. Please put your hands together for her. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Her Ladyship. Um, members of the University Council, members of Convocation, members of the UPSA community, invited guests, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am very privileged to be here today and to be a part of this um, program. And um, when I was invited, I looked at a topic and then I said, oh my God, this is a very um, debatable topic. And um, from the labor unit department, you will notice that um, it is a very hot issue for employers and managers and employees alike. It has become very difficult to measure productivity because um, employers have difficulty in actually knowing what to measure, setting the targets. The need to drive productivity has therefore become a difficult task for us today in the face of changing business and employment trends where employees are exploring all forms of flexible work. So because of that, we are finding it difficult to depart from the standard usual ways that we know to set targets, to measure productivity, and to make it even more complex, we have the generation of Z Alpha, the younger workers coming up, and they have a different view, concept, perception of work, and how it should be measured or how they want to perform it. It makes it difficult, and therefore we need to develop ethical standards for all forms of work and growing generations of workers alike. High productivity is driven by good standards, good work ethics, and as a public institution, we need to look forward to celebrating higher ethical standards, certain behavior standards at the workplace. The modern workplace requires professionalism, integrity, and as we create this positive, productive work environment, we should be able to create these standards at any given work location that we find our workers to be. Ethical work standards help us to create positive work culture, enshrined in workplace policies, personal values, professional codes of conduct, and these spur us on to be diligent, to be reliable and committed to our work. It means that we need to take responsibility. It means that we need to take responsibility for what we stand for and represent at work, and then that will help us to create workplace culture that fosters productivity and business success. As we prepare to celebrate the Labor Day, let us review our ethical standards in view of changing business trends and to also look at how we can improve our codes and standards that we have set and used over the years to align with changing business situations. With our combined efforts, there is no limit to what we can achieve, and I look forward to um, better standards and revised views to support our work in today's business environment, and especially looking at our new generation of workers coming up. Thank you very much. And Bernard, my middle name is Ayeki. Thank you. All right. Forgive me. So let me, let me mention it properly. Dr. Yvonne Ayeki Lamte. Ayekan is a different thing. Forgive me. Well, viewers, this is the moment we've been waiting for. We are here at the uh, Ohini Kunedo Auditorium of the UPSA for the sixth in the series for International Labor Day Public Lectures on the theme, Harnessing Good Work Ethics for Higher Productivity. To now introduce our keynote speaker, I have the honor to invite a research fellow, 
and a hard-working member of the planning committee, Mrs. Erika Mamle Osai, to introduce our guest speaker. Good morning. I stand on existing protocols, as the Nigerians will see. So I have the singular honor to introduce our special guest speaker today. And I crave your indulgence to bear with me. It's a little long. Justice Gertrude Araba Isaba Sakitokonu, Mrs. joined the judicial service in 2004 as one of the first justices of the commercial division of the High Court. She was promoted to the Court of Appeal in 2012 and to the Supreme Court in December 2019. Justice Saki Tokon has played several leadership roles in ensuring the achievement of judicial reforms in Ghana. Among them, Vice Chair of the E-Justice Oversight Implementation Committee, in brackets, E-Justice e OC, from its inception in 2019, and Chairperson of the E-Justice OC since August 2021. Member of the Faculty and Governing Board of the Judicial Training Institute. Vice Chair of the Internship and Clerkship Committee of the Judiciary since 2012. Chair of the Publishin Publications and Edit Editorial Committee of the Association of Magistrates and Judges of Ghana from 2006 to 2020. Chair of the e-judgment and e-library committee responsible for developing electronic research resources for judges since 2012. Supervising judge of the commercial division of the high court since 2013 and member and chair of various ad hoc committees needed for the smooth administration of the work of the judicial service. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as supervising judge of commercial court since 2013, Justice Saki Tokonu has led the setting of agenda for and chaired the meetings and programs of the users committee of the commercial courts. She chaired the judicial services components of the National Business Environment Enhancement Program and currently chairs the enforcing contracts in quotes component of the business regulatory reform initiatives managed by the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Through several leadership initiatives, she has quietly ensured the sustenance of a keen culture of efficiency in the commercial division of the high courts. As part of the faculty of the Judicial Training Institute since 2005, and a board member of the Judicial Training Institute since 2018, Justice Saki Tokonu has actively participated in initiatives to enhance the learning of judges through curricula focused on the distinctions between judicial skills, the social context of judicial work, and core black letter law. This work has included being a trainer of trainers and leading the development of the first manual for training in judicial ethics, as well as the curriculum for teaching and lesson applications of ethical principles into the daily routines of judges. Justice Saki Tokonu's work as a judge involves the writing of judgments and rulings on substantive law, legal philosophies, rules of procedure, of equity that focus on doing substantial justice and avoiding miscarriage of justice. She has several academic research articles and publications to her credits. I have picked three out of the numerous topics to excite you. One, Nuremberg, Congo, and Libya. Has might remained right or right has become might? A look at the international commitment to peaceful resolution of conflicts. Two, 
Fitting square pegs in round holes. The vexed question of harmonizing international legal regulation of traditional cultural expressions in intellectual property law. Three, creating capital from culture, rethinking the provisions on expressions of folklore in Ghana's copyright law. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this clearly shows that Justice Saki Tokonu, indeed, bridges the gap between theory and practice, as she is both a theoretician and a practitioner. Her professional career has included the receipt of various awards, including an award by the International Bar Association for the development of construction law practice in the early years of her legal practice. Being the first awardee of a scholarship by the International Association of Women Judges after a keen global selection process in 2010, and the Women of Excellence Award in Judicial Integrity under the auspices of the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection. She attended Wesley Girls High School, Cape Coast, Achimota School, Accra, for her O and A levels, respectively, a proud alumnus of the University of Ghana, Legon, Ghana Law School, the Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University, the Netherlands, The Hague, and the Golden State University, San Francisco, USC. Justice Gertrude Saki Tokonu is married and has four daughters and three grandchildren. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let us, with a standing ovation, welcome Her Ladyship, Justice Gertrude Araba Kesalba Saki Tokonu. Good morning. Kindly resume your seat. I told her to take out that standing ovation. <laughs> we share a joke when we were in ISS together, um, Mrs. Osai and myself. And she said there was this gentleman who said, with a standing renovation. <laughs> <laughs> so I told her, take out the standing renovation. <laughs> but she wouldn't. <laughs> Thank you very much. The Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor John Kwekumen Samauto, my Lords of the Superior Court of Judicature who are with me here, members of the University Council, members of Convocation, members of the UPSA community, invited guests, friends from the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the warm welcome it is a privilege to be invited to be a discussant in the highly esteemed pre-May Day lecture series of the Institute of Work, Employment and Society of the University of Professional Studies. In the present discussion, I intend to place a mirror between the challenges, tensions, push and pull factors that weaken productivity on one hand and communication, law, ethics, and technology are strong pillars upon which increased productivity can be built on the other hand. It is appreciated that the effectiveness of any person or institution always starts with the clarity of their vision and ability to set goals and achieve those goals. So kindly allow me to start with a look at the vision statement of IWES. Your stated vision is to be a world-class institution for the advancement of knowledge through policy-guided research, tra training, and advocacy aimed at developing human resources everywhere. As can be seen from the above mission, vision statement, vision expresses the desired results from time spent on any particular area of the life of an individual or institution. It is invariably derived 
from the mental image that expresses what the individual or institution wants to use their time and efforts to become. A necessary partner of any vision statement is a mission statement. The mission statement, unlike the vision statement, which expresses a picture or image, focuses on activities. Mission statements, therefore, articulate the umbrella and strategic activities that an individual or institution believes will lead to achieving the desired images in the vision statement. So in the case of IWES, your mission is expressed in these words. To carry activities that would promote knowledge through research, training, consultancy, and advocacy services focused on the development of human resources, governmental and non-governmental organizations, and the society at large. This is done through conducting research that reflects current issues on work, employment and social issues relevant for practitioners, organizing fora for discourse and debate as a platform for experts to share knowledge and disseminate information, Provide, providing cutting edge education, training and capacity development based on research insight, engaging with business, and other stakeholders in order to track real workplace issues that require attention. And finally, documenting and acting as a resource center for collecting, storing, and disseminating information on work, employment, and society. As part of your mission, you say that the work and employment division of the institute will produce high quality data and rigorously research on data that influence public policies and organizational context. You also say that this division hopes to define what, quote, decent work, unquote, is, focusing on the content and context within which they are performed. It will also encapsulate the importance of productivity and skills needed for high productivity. Reviewing these vision and mission statements present an exciting view of the work of the Institute and what stakeholders can expect from your work. The first source of, or source of tension for any institution, however, rises after the beautiful expression of their vision and mission statement. It is the salient question of how the Institute can ensure that the activities outlined in the written vision and mission statements are adhered to by the teams within the institution. A second source of tension arises from how one can measure the achievement and success of the indicators within the vision. Simply put, what are the signposts, goalposts, and indices of success? And how are they to be achieved realistically? Enter the concept of productivity. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as, quote, the effectiveness of productive effort, especially in industry, measured in terms of the rate of output per unit of input. In the Encyclopedia of Business and Finance, productivity is described as efficiency of production of goods or services expressed by some measure. It is also described as the ability to achieve significant results over a target period of time. Productivity comes from the ability to translate the nice image and task lines into real and measurable success. For one to identify whether you have been productive or not, therefore, there must be measurement from indices set at the beginning of a venture. Because of this, goal setting to achieve elements of vision can be said to be effective only if the goal setting process enables calculation and measurability of acceptably quantifiable results. So having identified the desired vision and mission activities expected to lead to the desired vision, one must set goals that match up to crisp and clear measurable indicators that will confirm more, that, that will confirm whether the output of activities is low, average, or high. The more indicators within the vision that are achieved, the higher the productivity. The fewer the indicators, the lower the productivity. But as intellectually stimulating as all of the above theoretically sound statements are, 
Reality educates that there is real tension in the journey between vision and productivity. That tension arises because translating desire into reality through effective work plans that will bring in the tangible measurable result is a process that can be frustrated by all sorts of risk factors. These risk factors may be human, mechanical, or the failure of processes that were designed to assist achievement, but failed because of unexpected circumstances. My view, which I bring to the discussion of your esteemed institute today, is that for workplaces to be distinctly, distinctively productive and to avoid or reduce their inevitable risk factors, the crisp and discernible elements in the vision of any organization must be reiterated consistently and clearly for all teams and kept at the foreview of all stakeholders. Vision and mission statements must go beyond being documents that are assumed to be read. They must be translated into bite-sized line items and communicated actively on a constant basis through all media of communication in the workplace. I think it is realistic to appreciate that when we seek a job or position in a workplace, the motivation for applying to work in that place hardly has anything to do with the vision, mission, and identifiable strategic task, task lines of the place. We expect to be given orientation and directions on how to do the particular job we, we are to, to, to execute. And we expect that as we play our roles in the manner that we have been oriented, the organization will be satisfied with our output. When we receive feedback that the organization is not meeting its productivity targets, the usual first thought is not to identify how we individually could have caused it, but to presuppose that someone in leadership will respond to the situation. What if we are the one in leadership? I believe that this salient question is part of the provocation for the discussions that today's theme is supposed to uh, raise. Before attempting to answer that under underlying query, I wish to also observe that the challenge of aligning any team member's personal reasons for being at work with the institution's vision, mission, and productivity indices is heightened by the diversities of expertise, socializations, and personal goals of individual team members within any workplace. As is evident, diversities clash with coherence, and incoherence decreases the capacity to achieve or to be productive. So, Mr. Provisi, in this contribution, I wish to propose four tools for consideration by the discussions of the Institute. The first tool is effective communication. The second is law and regulation. The third is technology. An important aspect of the consideration of these tools, these three tools, however, is the fact that without institutional ethical values applied to the engagement of these or any other tool for increasing productivity, they will not, they will not work as well as they are supposed to. It is my view that each of these three tools easily play effective roles in harmonizing diverse expertise. And the fourth tool is ethical values. They play effective roles in harmonizing diverse expertise, goals, and mindsets in the quest for a desired organizational vision and the achievement of that vision through higher rates of productivity. But each of these tools must also compel the engaging of ethical values to permeate their operation. The need for clear communication in the workplace. Like Rekwanasi stories, there is, a, there is an anecdote that appears in various models from different sources of storytelling. My favorite version of this story comes from a fictional character called Imma Precious Ramutri, who is the protagonist in a series of books authored by a good storyteller called Alexander McCall Smith. Emma Ramutre is introduced as the first female private investigator in Botswana, 
who in a bid to create a viable business, set up the number one ladies detective agency. If you haven't read it, I hope you have watched the series. In one of her career adventures, she's asked to investigate why people kept dying in a particular ward in a hospital. The hospital administrators were at their wit's end on how to stop the deaths because a careful watch of all persons who visited the intensive care unit revealed that no strangers were entering the ward. The deaths also occurred on a particular day of the week. After careful investigations, Emma Precious unraveled the mystery. The day of the accident was the day when the regular cleaner took time off. The substitute cleaner had no idea that there was a correlation between the device hooked on the patient in that bed and the electrical socket that powered the device. So she would happily walk into the ward and plug the device, plug in her vacuum cleaner and vacuum clean thoroughly. She did her work to the best of her ability and in accordance with orientation. The only difficulty was that by the time her work was finished, the patient had been fatally affected by the loss of flow from the hook device. They died soon after. How could one team member's work, good work, destroy the significant output of the entire organization? The answer is simple, even if intriguing. Lack of clear communication about the peculiar nature of that ward, the machines in that ward, the bed and the patients in it, and the presumption that because that team member's work does not feed into the carefully outlined goals and tasks that determine the productivity indices of the institution, they do not need orientation in the specialized nature of the institution. This is a difficult story that made interesting reading, but it clarifies that in any workplace, it is not only the quote specialist who affects the output. Everyone counts. And lack of communication of signposts, goalposts, and indices of success, and a constant flow of why things are what they are can affect effectiveness in the most significant way. My view is that in any arena where persons with diverse expertise, orientations, and socializations are required to achieve identified outputs, there can never be, quote, too much information, unquote, regarding what those outputs are and the issues that lead to the outputs. Transparency, clarity, and continuity of engagement and collaborations are always critical ethical values that must be harnessed to ensure productivity because any chain is as strong as its weakest link. Communication increases understanding, and understanding increases cooperation and collaboration. Communication increases learning, and learning increases capacity to achieve. It does not matter that the communication is with regard to the most technical subject, so long as it is presented in a clear, simple, and bite-sized manner. No, quote, technical subject, unquote, need be considered as complicated for any member of a team in an institution. And uh, I'd just like to share here something that I found very useful when I was a trial judge. Usually, people who come to court are emotionally stirred up. They are stirred up by their pain. They are stirred up by the whole court process. So when a person has to sit in the witness box, they, you can, they, their emotion is almost palpable. However, because of the technical nature of the legal hearing, I, I, as the person who is managing the court, realize that if I don't communicate to this person that I am not so interested in your emotion, I am interested in your words. And that the, at that time in the high court, there were two courts above me, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. And I will tell the witness that, you know, I am the one who is going to create this record. This record will be, he will be done by myself as a single judge. But if at the end of the trial, you are not happy with my judgment and you appeal, three judges will sit on it. And if you are not happy with the judgment of the Court of Appeal, 
and you go to the Supreme Court, five judges will sit on it. And if there's a need for review, seven judges will sit on it. So you may just find that the record you're about to give today may be used by as many as 10 judges before this matter is finally put to bed. And invariably, that information calms the person down. They realize that what they're about to do has more to do with rec recollecting everything that is needed to ensure that they win their case than telling the judge that they are very upset. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I bring in this to show that even though it's a matter of um, record management, it is also an important point to communicate to the witness so that the witness does their best. So that at the end of the day, as a judge, you have the best material to ensure that you have given substantial justice. In my profession of law, it is no secret that the persons that can teach any junior lawyer the most about practical organization of briefs and case management include the clerks in a firm or registry. They know practical factors such as the location of filing points and the practical linkages in the court system. Transparency in communication, engagement, and collaboration are therefore critical ethical values for increasing productivity for all stakeholders. This now leads me to law, legality, and regulation. Law and regulation carry compelling innate ability. Except for the person who refuses to or is unable to comply at a given time, law allows for harmonization of behavior. It is law and regulation that sets working conditions, and through that, they direct behavior of all persons within an institution, or they must. What is interesting about law and regulation is that often, citizens do not know how deeply our everyday lives are dictated by law and regulation. Even the character of the most mundane resources, such as how wide a road should be, how birth should be registered, and what constitutes a valid marriage or a void contract are dictated by law. We engage in transactions all the time without much conscious attention to thinking up to, uh, to conscious attention to law. And yet when any situation goes wrong, it is law that is used to settle rights and obligation, obligations. In this wise, Law and regulation provide crisp external indicators to direct diverse personal goals into harmonious conduct. And harmonious conduct increases productivity for the achievement of organizational goals. Law and regulation motivate and mobilize standards of behavior that produce desired organizational culture. They also reduce incoherence and the dysfunction that may arise from diverse outlooks from the unique individuality of team members. It is, however, to be noted that the meeting point between law, regulation, and confidence in the working environment lies in the assurance of fairness in the regulatory environment of any working space. In order to motivate voluntary compliance, therefore, it is critical to bear in mind the need to incorporate the ethical value of fairness as a standard in any regulatory system. How is fairness achieved? The National Model on Creation of Law is a good model to use to discuss the subject of fairness. Article 1251 of the 1992 Constitution provides, and I quote, Justice emanates from the people and shall be administered in the name of the republic by the judiciary, which shall be independent and subject only to this constitution." Unquote. This simple statement is extremely pregnant. What it means is that what is acceptable as just and indicative of justice emanates from the people. Justice is not imposed, but flows out. And justice is not a concept in philosophy. It is the identifiable product of lawmaking. In practical terms, law in this country is never made by those who administer it, but by everyone who uses it. It is created by those it directs before it begins to direct 
its creators. Let me further explain. The laws of Ghana are identified in Article 11 of the 1992 Constitution. It reads, the laws of Ghana shall comprise A, this Constitution, B, enactments made by or under the authority of the parliament established by this Constitution, C, any orders, rules, and regulations made by any person or authority under a power conferred by this Constitution, D, the existing law, and E, the common law. Two, the common law of Ghana shall comprise the rules of law generally known as the common law, the rules generally known as the doctrines of equity, and the rules of customary law, including those determined by the Superior Court of Judicature. Three, for the purposes of this article, customary law means the rules of law which by custom are applicable to particular communities in Ghana. Two, four, the existing law shall Four, the existing law shall, except as otherwise provided in clause one of this article, comprise the written and unwritten laws of Ghana as they existed immediately before the coming into force of this constitution. And any act, decree, law, or statutory instrument issued or made before that date, which is to come into force on or after that date. Five, subject to the provisions of this constitution, the existing law shall not be affected by the coming into force of this constitution. Six, the existing law shall be construed with any modifications, adaptations, qualifications, and exceptions necessary to bring it into conformity with the provisions of this constitution, or otherwise to give effect to, or enable effect to be given to, any ch changes affected by this constitution. End of quotes. In priority of power, and compelling force, therefore, law in Ghana starts with the constitution at the head. Then it moves to legislation passed by parliament on the second tier. Said in line of priority of law is orders, rules, and regulations made by a person with power conferred by the constitution. In fourth order of strength is a law that was existing before the 1992 constitution. The fifth in the ladder of strength is a common law of Ghana. What is notable about the common law of Ghana is that it incorporates all the customary laws of every ethnic group, whether written or unwritten, as they existed before the coming into force of the 1992 constitution. Law in Ghana, therefore, is what the people create for themselves as law. Whether it is the constitution written for us by representatives of the constituent assembly, or laws written by, parliament of, uh, by a parliament of representatives who have been voted for by the constituencies that are themselves created by law, or regulations of local assemblies or customary law. It is always the people who use the law who decide what is law. It is only when law is shaped by those who are guided by it that those who administer it, in this case, the judiciary and the various tribunals created by law, can interpret and apply it to its stakeholders. This is what infuses fairness into law and makes law synonymous with justice. This distribution of the power of law allows a sense of fairness to permeate community living so that those who are affected by law embrace it, work with it, and submit to it. It also allows harmonization of diverse views and harnessing of different outlooks for the achievement of common goals. Fairness as an ethical value in the workplace is therefore a product of known and accepted regulation. When regulation is made up of rules that stakeholders are aware of and contribute to the making of, their submission to the rules produce a culture that is orderly, predictable, and harmonious among diverse, diverse people. This culture can then be carefully ca calibrated and guided through the upgrading of law and regulation in order to produce higher standards of conduct. Through this, teams can be led towards ever increasing standards of outputs that they find acceptable themselves. It is within this context that this paper suggests 
that efforts must be made in workplaces to produce clear records of how stakeholders expect the workplace to be regulated for maximum productivity. And these clear regulatory lines should be created from consensus by as many stakeholders as possible. The more stakeholders own regulation, the easier it is for peer-to-peer -peer reminder of best practices to be shared, leading to strong organizational cultures built on the accepted regulation. I'll now move to technology. Undoubtedly, market consensus is that technology is an outstanding servant for increased productivity. I believe that anyone who has been able to pay their water bill, electricity bill, cable network bill, and send money electronically without expending transport costs, travel time, and energy moving to various locations around the city will attest to this. Technology allows efficiency, speed, and critical records to be captured easily. Just look at your Google fo footprints for the last month, and you'll be startled by how the simple carrying of your phone with you can tell everyone where you have walked, sat, and been in that period of time including those you have been with. <laughs> and, and the story is told about four people who were charged with conspiracy, um, conspiracy to commit murder. And all of them had very tight alibis. The case could not have been cracked, but for the fact that their phones were taken from them. And the phones, their footprints, Electronic footprints, digital footprints, virtual footprints show that all four of them were where they were supposed to have committed the crime. So, um, as you carry your phone along, it's keeping your records. I had a particularly interesting experience about 10 years ago that woke me up to the outstanding nature of technology. I had visited a family member in an university in Massachusetts and was sitting in her third floor room chatting with her. Suddenly, she looked at her phone and informed me that her laundry that was being done in one of several washing machines in the basement was finished. How do you know, was my question. She showed me an app on her phone. It provided information on the washing machines in the basement. From the app, she could tell that the particular machine her things were in, had finished washing. No one needed to keep walking up and down from third floor to basement to check on washing because of the technology that had been designed to respond to that simple process. A second experience. Recently, I went looking for a friend who was staying with a host in, in, in a suburb in Accra. I tried to locate the place with Google Maps. It was still difficult to locate the house. I called her host who was still at work, and he informed me that he was going to track my car on Google. While sitting in his office, he told me that he could see me in my car. He could see my car. He then set about directing my car to the house. He was talking with me on phone. He could see me because every movement of the car was visible to him through the internet. Technology is a great servant. It has served humanity in increasing measure for more than a century. As is widely known, the technology used for telephony was patented in 1876. Television technology was successfully demonstrated by 21-year-old Philo Taylor Fansworth in 1927. And the fundamental theoretical work on information theory was also developed in the 1920s. Computer science brought exponential growth in these building blocks from the 1950s. Interconnectivity started to be utilized in 1986, and the architecture of the regulatory mechanisms, such as orderly distributions of domain name systems, led to commercial internet systems from 1989 in the USA and Australia. By 1990, work had been done to establish the World Wide Web, which is a world system that allows all of these technologies to converge and be distributed. All of this information is easily assessed with a search for the history of the internet, demonstrating the monumental value of search engines to knowledge, learning, and capacity building. So one of my recommended tools for higher productivity 
is easily the engagement of technology. But I must immediately introduce a caveat or certain ethical considerations if workplaces are to efficiently utilize technology to promote productivity. My experience in leading the development of e-justice has shown me that harnessing technology in the workplace is not as easy as may be supposed when one is looking in from the outside. Let me illustrate with the e-justice system that a court user in the 52 law court complex in Accra is likely to find. The pillars of any efficient e-justice delivery system are e-filing, e-service, e-docket management, e-case distribution, virtual or e-hearings, and e-execution of judgments. In order to do all this efficiently, there must be an efficient national electronic payment system which allows court users to file documents from wherever they are. The documents should be received electronically for e-dockets to be created and assessed by judges, registrars, and court users. The documents must be capable of being served on court users electronically. Court users should be able to log into the virtual courtroom from wherever they are and be able to communicate with the managers of the court system. Currently, though e-filing is easy, because, of the, because the national quote unquote MOMO system is functioning well, the national electronic capture of telephone numbers is still a work in progress. And so the system has to make room for that infrastructure to be complete for e-service to be an everyday occurrence. Because access to justice is a constitutionally guaranteed right, e-service can only be compelled when the satisfaction that the vast majority of adults have facilities such as emails to receive court documentation. We will therefore see that when it comes to the use of technology, no institution is an island. Efficient deployment of technology requires a careful inclusion of every stakeholder who must use your service. And every process must be governed by the rules of the industry. I'd like us to take a minute to look carefully at our laptops, tablets, and our phones. I want you to please look at your phone right now, those of us with smartphones. You will see that it is covered by icons that allow us into the use of the device. It is said that for one smartphone to be created, no fewer than 50,000 patents on re relevant technologies are needed by the producer. Some of these technologies allow the use of the screen. Some allow for information to be moved. Some allow for information to be created. And some allow for information to be stored. Some of the technologies allow us to talk to each other. And some, and some, of, the and some of them allow us to see each other. The right to use these, each of these technologies is protected by licenses given to the innovators who have developed them. And to be able to use them effectively, one must be able to harness resources for the licenses and the knowledge required. This is the extent of harmony needed to create and manage any technology. Copyright ownership in various software, trademark ownership in icons used in devices, and patent, hold, patent holders in all the relevant technologies must be respected and harnessed seamlessly and effectively for the production of any form of technology that increases productivity. Without active collaboration, cooperation, studying, sharing, and synchronization of efforts with all providers who must assist with the smooth transmission of digital technology, what ought to be a comforting tool for doing business can end up being a journey in frustration. So the recommendation of using technology in any institution comes with a caution. Technology offered for the work of an organization must be carefully examined for efficiency, sustainability, and ease of use. Strong teams must be built to sustain the system and aid culture change when technology is introduced in, in any system. There, there are always people ready to sell software, but you must know whether it is worth buying it. There must be sharing with co-producers of the technology and a constant stream of communication with users and stakeholders. This calls for the ethics of diligence, attention to detail, commitment to change, and commitment 
to constant learning. It is this careful design and deployment of relevant technology, supported by strong institutional ethical cooperation and support that can allow for increased productivity. In conclusion, suppose Pro Vice Chancellor and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Harnessing good work ethics for higher productivity will always require the multi-pronged approaches needed for success in any life endeavor. Vision is not enough. Mission statements are not enough. Goals per se are not enough. Strong tools such as clear communication, a culture of accepted regulation, and efficient use of technology can be engaged to assist in this journey. It is my hope that these thoughts can con contribute to the work of IWES. Thank you very much for the invitation, and God bless the institution. Oh, oh come on. Is this the best you can do? Wow. You know, we were enjoying the thing so much. And we felt like, Charlie, now you are coming to coast. Then you just finished. How many of you felt like that? You know, I mean, let's put hands together one more time. Her ladyship, Justice Gertrude Tokonu, JSC, delivering the sixth International Labor Day lecture on harnessing good work ethics for higher productivity. And look, we won't say anything about lecture. We'll just let it sink in. You know, it was just exciting. We enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed. So to, to allow it to sink in, we would have typically had a musical interlude, but you are very busy people. So what we'll do is, <laughs> uh, I, I won't sing. <laughs> we will we'll do a quick presentation, and then we'll acknowledge some of our key guests, and then we'll be out of your way. So to do the presentation, it is my pleasure to invite the, um, director uh, for the center who gave us the opening remarks, Dr. Mrs. Mary Esiel. She will come and do a very quick presentation to our guest speaker. Please put your hands together for, for her as she comes with the team to do the presentation. Right, madam. Where we have the Anna. Right, okay. So looking at so many things that we know excite you, one of the names we came across is that you are the model judge. So that is one thing we found about you. And the other thing is that you love flowers. So looking around, we said, we'll give you this as a token from the University of Professional Studies, Accra. <laughs> so that as you ascend to the throne, Madam, we always want you to remember UPSA and also remember IWIS. So this is a Little talking from all of us to you. Can I say oh, yes, please. I think that you couldn't have chosen a better present. Uh, Lucky Bamboo. And I'm very grateful for it. It will journey with me through the years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Put your hands together one more time for the team that put this together. It, indeed, we want to acknowledge a number of people shortly, if you will permit us to, to do this. We have um, a whole raft of important people. I will just mention the name, and you would acknowledge with a round of applause. As I said, Honorable Stingame is here. Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Colonel Adotea Sari, uh, District Minister, thank you, sir, for coming. Uh, Reverend Father Anthony the Dongo, Queen of Peace Parish, Medina. Reverend, thank you so much. Many years ago, I was a member of the Queen of Peace. <laughs> uh, from the uh, organized labor, Gao TUC, Edward Carriway. I think I saw him somewhere. Thank you, sir, for coming. 
uh, from the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, Mr. William Suekuma. Thank you for coming. We are also privileged to have from the Ghana Armed Forces, Colonel Matthew Asuka. Colonel Matthew Asuka. Thank you, sir. Uh, from WIB, Mrs. Enchiwa Asante. WIB, thank you. Again, from Gaek, uh, Mr. Yabua, Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, came with a strong delegation. Organized Labor Nat, Mr. Daniel Afadu. Mr. Daniel Afadu, thank you. From Civil Society, IDEG, Mami Efua Edusei. Thank you for coming. From EAM, Roland Grace. From EAM, thank you. And we also have uh, our lords from the Superior Courts, and uh, we have the we are privileged to have His Lordship Justice George Kumsin here with us. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you from the Court of Appeal. His Lord, also, sorry, I'm doing the second one. Yes, so he's from the Supreme Court. Yes, Justice George Kumsin from the Supreme Court. Please put your hands together. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't want to be a lawyer because when I, I, I was a young journalist, I went to cover a court proceeding and the way the judge paid me you know I said this thing <laughs> but listening to you I thought Charlie it would be nice to appear before you you, you, uh, you have a sense of humor you know so maybe it's not too late I didn't know judges could crack jokes <laughs> because <laughs> you know we, we had a, my, my grandfather's uh, my grandmother's young brother was a judge and when he comes they, we all have to scatter <laughs> So I, I thought you people were, were staying. So thank you. From the Court of Appeal, uh, is Lordship Justice Noble in Cancer. Please acknowledge. Uh, from the High Court, is Lordship, Her Ladyship Justice Ellen Vivian Amoa. Thank you, madam. From the Judicial Service, Eunice Koda. Judicial Service. So a strong delegation. We also want to acknowledge the committee that work like clockwork to put this together. So uh, our chairperson, of course, is our director, Dr. Mary Nane Sion, put your hands together for her. And um, the uh, lady who brought all of us, she called me first, uh, Mrs. Erika Mamle Osai. Thank you so much. Works like clockwork. Other members of the committee, Dr. Francis Kakusi Apia, please give us a wave. Mr. Lawrence Ofe Asari. These are all faculty members of the university. Mrs. Hilda Apia, please put your hands together. Mrs. Dorothy Siaumafo, as well as Ms. and Mrs. Bridget Elikem Mensa. And then the Public Affairs Directorate of the UPSA uh, are also part of the committee. Thank you so much. This uh, speech will be replayed on CTTV many, many times. So for those of you who were writing, there were a lot of things she was saying we were writing that we couldn't put down. So you can watch again this evening, 5 p.m. It will be replayed so you can finish the notes. And for the students here, it will come in the exam. So <laughs> I'm just telling you. So please, I, I was doing my notes. I, I got the effective communication part. I was happy she led with communication. Usually people think communication is a soft issue, so they throw it at the end. But she led with it and it, before she even discussed law and regulation. So that was heartwarming. And then, of course, the hierarchy of laws is very good for us. And then technology. Your anecdotes are just amazing. I mean, can I, can I borrow them on air? <laughs> Since you are, you are a copyright lawyer, so I have to ask permission first. You know. So really wonderful uh, delivery there. We want to now invite, I believe, for the vote of thanks, uh, Dr. Francis Kakusi Apia, to do the vote of thanks. <laughs> Member of the committee as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All protocols observed. Um, I believe he's actually done half of my work for me. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Avle. But first of all, I'd like to thank the almighty God for giving us good health and for gathering all of us to be here. So we thank God. And secondly, we'd like to thank her ladyship. I'm so excited to have been given this opportunity Aside being in the legal fraternity, I also fly the flag of gay. So I'm very excited. <laughs> so being the very first, just to repeat, the very first to give the vote of thanks. Yes, let it be on record. 
after her ladyship's nomination. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. And I know especially now that you've been nominated, you have a lot of things to do. But we are most grateful. And we've learned a lot. That's effective communication, law and regulation, technology, and of course, ethics are important to ensure productivity and to protect our income and pension. So thank you so much, Elidisho. And to our superior court justices who made it here, we are also very grateful for coming. And of course, to our landlord, Prof. Mauto, thank you so much for always being there to support us. To our distinguished guests from various institutions, TUC, NADS, our sister university, University of Ghana, and our Lord Spirituals who are all here, as well as members from the Ghana Armed Forces. We are very grateful for making time out to support us. To members of staff, students, and the members of the media, thank you so much for also being here. We would also, of course, we couldn't have done this without the support of our wonderful sponsors. So at this point, we'd like to thank uh, Anglo Gold Ashanti and City FM. We are so grateful for supporting us. And to the wonderful team, IWES. Thank you so much. And we look forward to the next one as well. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Council. It looks like everybody's updating their CV. So me too, I'm going to update my CV as the first, uh, what, what is the, what, how do I describe it? First moderator since the nomination. <laughs> then by the time she gets uh, confirmed, yeah, it will be serious. Nomination, Pony, wonderful. So uh, a couple of quick announcements. There will be refreshments. Students will be directed as to where to go. Other guests will be directed as to where to go as well. There will also be, sorry, did I say something wrong? Sorry. Uh, but no, no, yes, refreshment. So those who didn't come will close the door, don't join. <laughs> you know, and then there will also be group photographs which will be coordinated by, yes, so, we'll, and so please wait if you're an invited guest, we'll do it in a very orderly fashion. And please don't come and use your mobile phone to take a picture and say, me and the new Chief Justice. <laughs> we will not allow mobile phone photos. We won't do it, please, I beg you. So. We will strictly, uh, Madam, you coordinate the photo taking. It's very important because you go and see it on Instagram and somebody will even put something on your face, a flower and things, they will, they will damage it. So we won't allow uh, mobile phone photographs for this occasion. Please, let, let's respect that, please. So I'm going to now call the Director of Council at uh, UPSC, Reverend Stephen Champong, to give us the closing prayer. Reverend Stephen Champong, where is he? And the photos will be taken in here. Will be taken in here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shall we please bow our heads for prayers? Gracious Father, we want to thank you. Our loving Father from heaven, God of all grace, we thank you for strength and for the wisdom and energy and the grace that you bestowed upon us this morning. We thank you for this program. And we thank you for the issues that have been raised. We pray for the grace. We pray for the energy to implement even these things to help harness work ethics and productivity in Ghana. Lord, we thank you so much for blessing our coming. Now we are departing. We are departing from here and we ask that you bless our departure. We ask that the peace of God that passes all understanding the peace that comes only from our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace that the word cannot give.
peace that comes only from our Lord. May that peace be with us. May that peace be in our workplace. May that peace be with us in our various home. We ask as we leave for our various destination, Lord, dispatch your innumerable company of angels. Let them take us safely to our various places. This we ask in, our, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.